Yep, we are recording, so that is all good. Okay. Yeah, if you can't record a session, we're screwed because <laughs> the, then the whole rest of the class can't see the see the session. Do you know have any idea how long it takes to upload these Zoom sessions onto YouTube? I can imagine. Oh my God! It, I did one yesterday for acoustics. It took an hour and fifty minutes. Wow! You might as well just walk away from the computer and go do something else. Go oh shopping. Do something. <laughs> Come that back when crazy. it's over. <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow. But anyway, we will finish off good old ANSI testing today. And we covered last week a whole bunch of lies. No, I'm just kidding. A whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> 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 on on what you know what ANSI testing is for, how it tests the hardware of a hearing aid, not the software, and we went over the pieces and parts of the ANSI test box and described how it's all part of real ear measurement. Real ear measurement uses the same equipment, just a different piece of the equipment. Uh, we talked about couplers, the two cc coupler, and how it's meant to imitate the size of the closed human ear canal between the eardrum and the hearing aid itself. And we described how that 2cc coupler is actually too large, like how the space of air trapped is actually smaller in the human ear. And when something is smaller, then the sound is going to become larger, just like light reflecting off of mirrors in a room. The closer they are together, the more reflection you have. And so we call that difference real ear to coupler difference. And we said on average, real ear to coupler difference is about 5 dB below 1,000 hertz. And we said it's about 5, 10 dB above 1,000 hertz. In English, this means if you ran a hearing aid on an ANSI test box and you got some frequency response and you wanted to know how will that hearing aid actually function in someone's ear, well then add about 5 dB to the frequency response below 1000 hertz and add about 10 dB to that same frequency response above 1000 hertz and you'll get a pretty close idea as to how that hearing aid will actually function in a human's ear. And then we talked about that weird thing called KEMAR, Knowles Electronic Mannequin for Acoustic Research. And I'll see if I can now share screen and go to a PowerPoint here and uh, see what we got. So here's a, here's a slide I was making up just before the session and I never quite got done. Talk about incomplete. <laughs> I was actually made up this slide here to show how the human ear is a quarter wave resonator and all that stuff. But uh, anyway, we, let's look at good old real. Here's good old Kimar. And Kimar is just a nice fella. He never gets tired. And he's got a simulated ear. And he's got an ear canal that's more like the human ear. It's smaller, between 1 to 1.5 cubic centimeters in a human ear. At any rate, here's, the, here's a, a close-up of the inside of his head. Um, anyway, we talked about real ear to coupler difference being about 5 dB below 1,000 hertz and about 10 dB above 1,000 hertz. Here's the 2cc coupler response. Here's the human ear response, or KEMARS response. Real ear to coupler difference given to you in words or numbers, and you can see the bottom row of numbers here gives you the general idea again. And this outer ear canal resonance itself, this is something we'd cover in acoustics class, and you may even cover it, have covered it in anatomy, but this is something really important to keep in mind. This picture for real ear, as we cover real ear in this, later on in this course, this figure is going to figure large, okay? Look at the resonance and where it is, right between 1500 and 2000 hertz. The outer ear resonance is a gift of about 20 decibels, as you can read across the screen there. And the reason you've got that is, and this is a new slide, I just threw this one in, but it's just to, just to give you an idea, is because it gives you a lift for those high frequency consonants that are normally soft. 
They're the softest. And so it's nature's gift. The shape of that ear it naturally is made to resonate with the high frequencies of speech, thus elevating the loudness of the high frequency consonants. But hearing loss, of course, undoes this because now this is no longer enough. You've got a hearing loss sloping down, and so this added gift is no longer sufficient. Plus, when you plug up an ear canal with a hearing aid, you've lost that love and feeling. It's gone, gone. Gone. Oh, oh, oh. Anyway, Ted, keep your daytime job. So, <laughs> and the reason we've got this ear canal resonance is because the ear canal is a one quarter wave resonator. Like this cup I'm holding, it's closed at one end, open at the other. I, I won't spill my coffee on my keyboard. But at any rate, objects like cylinders that are closed at one end and open at the other are known as quarter wave resonators. They resonate with sound waves that are four times as long as the cylinder. So if this is one inch long, it's going to resonate with sound waves that are about four inches long. And those waves are between about 2,000 and 4,000 hertz. Cool. Wavelength sound over the frequency. Frequency is speed of sound over the wavelength. You can just calculate it that way and come right to about 3,400 hertz is what you'll get, you know. At any rate, I digress. <laughs> we then talked about gain. I'm going to take this off here and we'll look at where we are in the good old notes. And I'm still sharing screen here. Good. And as we get toward the bottom of our page, we talked about Keymar, real ear to coupler difference, gain in dB versus output in dBSPL. I remember we covered that last week. Very important to keep that always in your mind, okay? And then we talked about gain terms. These guys right here. And this also will figure large in real ear. Because the way they used to do hearing aid fittings before real ear was called functional gain. And that's when the person, <clears throat> you took the thresholds under headphones, wrote them down on the audiogram, then you took the person, put them in the same sound booth, and put a hearing aid singular in one ear, plugged up the other ear, and the guy listened to warble tones coming out of a speaker. And the guy raised his hand when he heard those. And you compared aided thresholds to unaided thresholds. And you, see, you, you try to see, oh, did that match the target of the fitting formula? Did that match the target? Well, it took forever. Then came real ear. And that gave you insertion gain. Same numbers. The fitting formula, the fitting method didn't change a whit. Just the way that you measured it did. Instead of comparing aided to unaided hearing thresholds, you stuck a tube in the guy's ear, and then you ended up measuring this guy here. I'm going to go up a slide. You ended up measuring this, and then you put the hearing aid on top of the tube, and you had the same sound coming in, and then you had a big line going like this with my arrow. So this was real ear unaided response, and then you had real ear aided response, and real ear aided minus unaided gave you the insertion gain. And you thought, ooh, does that match target? Did that match the target of the fitting method? Same idea as with functional gain, but just a totally different way of measuring it. Way faster. And today, we no longer even do that in real ear. Today, we don't really care as much about um, about the uh, unaided response of the ear. We don't really care that much about this guy. This thing here today is mainly used in order to tell that the tube is close enough to the eardrum. If it's not close enough to the eardrum, the response at 4,000 hertz will drop off. The 4,000 will hurt. Those, those hurts will hurt. They will be gone. So we use this, our real outer ear canal resonance, to, as a visual guide to help us decide whether the tube is close enough. Obviously, you can look in with an otoscope too, but uh, mm -hmm. at any rate, today we do real ear even differently. We use the tube in the ear, and we no longer measure unaided 
ear canal resonance anymore. Screw that. We just put the hearing aid on top of the tube, and then you've got a display that reads from the bottom up in DBSPL, and you're looking at the output. Today, we care all about the output. We don't give a fig about the gain. Boy, that comes really close to cussing, but I didn't quite, you know. So, but at any rate, we don't care about gain as much. And the analogy I think I gave last week was, did you get the bread from the store? We care about the output. What's the actual DBSPL slamming against your eardrum? Is that audible? And we look at it compared to your thresholds. So your thresholds are on the screen, and then you can see unaided speech on the screen, and you can see aided speech on the screen. So today's real ear measurement is really helpful in counseling and explaining to the client the benefit of the hearing aid. And that's what we'll learn later on in this course as well. I always like repeating, shooting ahead, looping back, you know, that way you've heard things a bunch of times before, and it's not all just one thing at a time. At any rate, so we will get to that later. Today we use insert in situ output. That's today's real ear method. In situ, Latin for hearing aid in situation, in place. And we look right on the screen itself. Real ear aided response is by far the main focus. I got some weird email popping in from some Dr. Rahim. Yeah, he's a speaker. He's going to be a speaker at a conference we're having here. Okay, sorry, Rahim. I can't get to you right now, but I will later. Now, we will talk about the specific ANSI procedures. And these are things you may have heard before, but let's just make sure the purpose of today, so we've reviewed what we did last week, and now we'll just press on and cover this, the remaining stuff in ANSI now. Now, Amber, have you done much, uh, uh, have you guys covered much ANSI testing in your previous courses? You know, I, it's been a while since I've taken a lot of those courses, so I don't really remember. Good, okay, fair enough. Then, then it's good that we'll just review this then, then this yes. has a good place. I'm glad you said that because otherwise I'd be boring you to tears with something you've already heard. So, no, I mean, I don't remember any of it, actually. Okay, well, let's look at this. Let's look at this puppy here. There's five main tests that we care about in ANSI testing. And they, they range from OSPL90 or SSPL90, also known as OSPL90, and then full-on gain, that's number two, so the first one is maximum output with 90 dB coming into the hearing aid, maximum output. The second one is leave the volume full blast, but now no longer make the input 90 anymore. Reduce it to 60. So it's more like speech. And now no longer look at the output. Let's look at what the full on gain of the hearing aid, the muscle of the hearing aid. What's its full on gain doing? The third test, and I'll just float my page down here. The third test is called reference test gain. The input is still 60. And you're looking at what the gain is going to be. But now you've got the volume reduced to a user volume, more like a half or two thirds. And reference test gain is meant to look at how is the hearing aid gonna function in everyday life at a user setting with average inputs like speech. And then the fourth thing is called equivalent input noise. Now you're looking at the junk produced by the hearing aid. How much crap is it producing? What's the, how much, what's that microphone, the noise made inside the hearing aid? And the last one that we really care about is harmonic distortion. Harmonic distortion. Now, that's how much, not the noise inside the hearing aid, that's not it anymore. Now you're looking at how much is the hearing aid distorting the sound? Like, if you put a 500 hertz tone into the hearing aid, is only a 500 hertz tone coming out of the hearing aid? Or are harmonics coming out of the hearing aid of a 500 hertz? In other words, when you invited Mary to the party, did Mary bring her kids along? 
okay? You want to know, is, is just the input, is, is it reflected in the output, or is, or is more than the input now in the output? Amplifiers all distort BTW, by the way. They all distort, okay? Hearing aids are no exception. Guess what else distorts? I'm going to stop sharing for a second and just kind of guess what else distorts. And this is something to keep in mind from your anatomy coverage. Your ear distorts, your cochlea, your hair cells, your outer hair cells amplify soft sounds below 50 dB. You're hearing it, your outer hair cells do that. And in so doing, your cochlea distorts. And guess what it produces? Auto-acoustic emissions. And audiologists use these to test infant hearing. You can also use them to test liars, okay? <laughs> OAEs are coming out of your ear. Just like when you work hard, you sweat. Well, sweat is a byproduct of your work. And just like in the outer hair cells, a byproduct of their constant amplifying is auto-acoustic emissions. If you don't have OAEs, Houston, you don't have distortion. But guess what? You also then don't have outer hair cells that are functioning. You've got a problem. You've got a hearing loss. So it's all amplifiers distort. And it's nice to tie this together. Hearing aids, your inner ear, same thing. Okay. So now I will share a screen again and we'll go back to the notes and look carefully here at the step number one. Let's look at OSPL90. Number one, if I can finally make my screen go there. Good grief, Ted. Hit the little arrow. Okay. <laughs> Hit the little arrow and make it go there. Okay. So, ANSI procedures on the hearing aid test box. Number one, SSPL90, also known as OSPL90. It's going to have a flatter shape compared to a gain curve. I'm going to show you a picture of it in PowerPoint. Okay. I'll just move on down here. Okay, we talked about this stuff. Okay, here's gain response. Look at this picture. You can tell it's gain because on the vertical axis it just says dB. It doesn't say dBSPL. Also, look at the number range, 70 to 20. That couldn't be output because output is input plus gain. So output is going to be like in the hundreds. Okay, and look also, there's a third thing here. Look at how the low frequencies, there's not as much. When you're looking at gain responses in a hearing aid, usually the most is at mid to high frequencies and less is in the lows. Now, when you look at, see how this drops down here? If you go to the next slide, there would be an OSPL90. It's more like everything is bloated. Everything is saturated. You've got a flatter frequency response. And look at the numbers. Wait, they're now over 100. Yep, that's output. Okay, input plus gain is output. And you can always see this. Here's gain response of an ITE in a 2cc coupler. Here would be the maximum power output of the same ITE in the 2cc coupler. Gain, output. Gain, output. So now you're looking at Keymar, and this is real ear to coupler difference, okay? This would be gain in a BTE, and you're looking at in the, in, in the 2cc coupler, the dashed line, and now you're looking at it in Keymar's ear, which is more like the human ear. About 5 dB in the lows, about 10 dB in the highs, and always remember the real ear, more, because the space is smaller. This is the logic to always follow, regardless of whether you're measuring OSPL90 or gain. OSPL90 or gain. So, and then here's an ITE, real ear to coupler difference for gain, real ear to coupler difference for maximum output. Do you see? All right. So, buttons and become uh, a tailor. Okay. <laughs> now, let's look at a typical OSPL90 response. So you've seen it, and now you've noticed how flat it is. We'll go back to our notes here and read about it. 
The purpose of OSPL90 is to find the maximum output SPL that the hearing aid can possibly produce, regardless of the input. This is where the hearing aid is saturating and can't put out any more. The procedure, volume control, full blast, input 90 dB SPL, and a sweep tone is run between two and 5,000 hertz. The hearing aid test box calculates the output and you see three things. This is what we need to memorize. You will see the three things here and I will show it to you on the PowerPoint slide. Down to the bottom here, Ted, look at this picture. Here's OSPL90 in the black, okay? And note, three things are shown. Go to the right here, volume control, full on. OSPL90, the picture's kind of hazy here, but OSPL90 is the line. You can see that where my cursor is. That's this. And then you'll see Max. Max is a nice name for a dog, but in this case it means maximum. It's the peak. The maximum OSPL90 is this peak right here. It's the highest you can go. It goes in this particular case, and that's going to be 130, as it says. And then the HFA, high frequency average. What's the output at 1,000 hertz? See the little block down there? And 1,600 hertz and 2,500 hertz. 1K, 1.6, 2.5. Memorize those three numbers. Those are the high frequency averages that are always done in ANSI testing. So in this case, they looked at what was the maximum power output or MPO. What was the MPO at 1000? What was the maximum power output at 1600? And what was it at 2500? They'll add those three numbers together, divide by three, and you've got your high frequency average. And if you look at the slide here, what was it? 124, okay? Those three things are shown on ANSI measures with OSPL90, okay? And that's the main thing to memorize. Going back to our, power, our, our Microsoft Word, the tolerance, the average OSPL90 at 1, 16, and 2,500 hertz with a 90 dB input should be within plus or minus 4 dB of manufacturer specs. So when someone comes in with a hearing aid that isn't working well, part of troubleshooting is running an ANSI test. And another thing you can do with ANSI is, what, a, what about the person who gets new hearing aids and says, they just don't sound like my old ones. I want them to sound like my old ones. Well then, for heaven's sakes, do an ANSI test on the old ones, print up what you got, and then hook the new hearing aids to the ANSI test box and run them and make, and you'll see visually where they're different. And you can adjust them to make them sound like the old one. It's very, the nice thing about ANSI is that it's objective and it gives you hard, concrete evidence instead of asking, how does that sound? How does that sound? And I've watched and listened to clinicians sitting there using that stupid phrase constantly. And it's just like, for heaven's sakes, either do ANSI or do real ear. Either one will give you objective, hardcore facts. Do you know how many audiologists no longer do ANSI? About 50%. You know how many audiologists no longer don't do real ear? About half, 50%. And with HISs, it's even worse. So it's like, you come out of OTC knowing your ANSI and knowing your real ear, you're probably about a light year ahead of a lot of dinosaurs that are out there practicing. So it, it behooves of us to mainly to really get a grip on this one. Number two, full on gain. Bottom of page, bottom of the page. Oh, bottom of the ninth. Well, oh, just about that point. Anyway, full on gain, fog. By the way, though, that was some Super Bowl. That was a humdinger. We, all, we were glued to that sucker up here, I'm telling you. 
that was that was a cliffhanger. Okay, full on gain, the second ANSI measure, and read what it says here. The purpose: find maximum available gain from the hearing aid. No, no longer the output. What's the gain? Procedure: volume control still left full blast. Linear hearing aids, you're going to have an input of 50, but no one uses linear hearing aids anymore. Most people use compression, okay? At any rate, there's your frequency sweep is run. Once again, hearing aid now calculates the gain. And read what it says below that. HAT does not, repeat, not show any frequency response curve. It just gives you numbers. It'll give you a number. And the tolerance better be within 5 dB of manufacturer specs. But looky, looky, here comes cookie, all right? Just the numbers for peak gain and high frequency average gain. Some equipment might show peak. Some equipment might show high frequency average. Either way, some equipment shows both. What does Teddy's equipment show? This one here just shows the gain of 60 dB input, I believe that's high frequency average, 51. So what you're going to be seeing there is just a number. And that's this right here, just what I'm covering. Now we go to the third measurement, and that's VC. You can read that at RTP. Not rest in peace, but reference test position. Reference test position. That means your volume control is reduced from full blast down to less. So let's look at this here. What is it? Go to the next page. All right, reference test gain. Reference test gain. The purpose is to show the gain for typical speech input with a typical VC position. Now, admittedly, there's a lot of hearing aids that no longer even have volume controls. Most RICs, most RIC hearing aids, lots of them no longer even have a volume control. Many software, lots of manufacturer fitting software today will give you a program to run your ANSI test on. And just follow that. They'll give you an actual program for ANSI testing. Program, set the hearing aid to that program, run your ANSI test, and relax and watch and dust blinking lights on the screen. Just follow the instructions. But on hearing aids that have volume controls, especially high power BTEs with the number 13 tubing, all of that, reference test gain. To show the gain for typical speech input with a typical VC performance or position, real life performance. Gives an idea of how the hearing aid will function with actual normal volume setting and typical speech inputs. So now the input has been reduced just like it was for full on gain from 90 down to 60. And this one here, the volume control is reduced. Procedure. Input is at 60 dB, and it should be said, it should actually say 60 dB SPL. That's an error, Teddy, okay? Only gain is measured in simple dB. Inputs, outputs are always dB SPL. Anyway, input is 60 dB SPL. Set your volume control so that the output is at OSPL 90. Get this, HFA minus 17. <laughs> and you think, oh my God. Well, the equipment will tell you. Reduce the volume a little bit and it'll say still more. Reduce the volume a little bit. Oh, you, put, you reduced it too much. Better bump it up a little bit. It'll tell you. There's a little gauge on the screen that, you can, that, that will tell you when, to, when you've reached the correct point. Now, the reason why they do minus 17, there's always reasons for this, okay? When you think of speech, and I'm going to kind of stop sharing screen, and I'll just let people see my ugly mug again so I can express myself better. But when you think about speech, okay, speech has about a 30 dB dynamic range. Whenever you think of dynamic range, it refers to intensity. And the peaks and valleys of speech are about 30 dB deep. 
So when I'm speaking to you in a sentence like I am right now, the loudest parts are 30 dB greater than the softest parts. Okay, that's the dynamic range of speech. Now, the, guess what, what else is people should know is that the average in the range between the, 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 the ceiling and the floor, the loudest and the softest parts of speech, the average ain't in the middle. The average is 12 dB below the top, and it's 18 dB above the bottom. Why isn't the average in the middle? The average ain't in the middle because unlike noise, like a fan, or an air conditioner, or even the hubbub and babble of background speech, speech from my flapping gums right now is in quiet. And it's it's staccato. It's when you listen to speech in a subway or go in a big city and listen to Chinese or Hungarian or a language you don't understand, that will give you an idea of how weird speech is and how dogs and cats are laughing their heads off at us. Okay, because <clears throat> at least they meow or they bark, but we're sitting here going. When you have speech doing that, the average intensity isn't in the middle. Only if the if the intensity is steady, like then the loudest and softest parts, the average will be right in the middle. But because speech is staccato, choppy. Its average isn't in the middle. And by the way, that's what digital noise reduction looks at in hearing aids. If the sound coming in the mic is steady state, the hearing aid goes, oh, must be noise, reduce the gain. And as soon as the sound coming into the hearing aid modulates, like fluctuates, the hearing aid goes, oh, must be speech, amplify the crap out of it. Did you know that? That's, a, that's how digital noise reduction works. It looks at that. Anyway, I digress. We should go back to good old share screen here and finish reference test gain. And so we shall. I like digressing though. It's, it's, uh, it, I like tying things together. But uh, does that make sense to you, Amber? Good stuff. Uh -huh. oh. All right, here we go. So now you've got the, re why are you reducing the, the, the 17 dB? Well, you're going to reduce it by 12 so that the peaks don't reach the top of that range. You won't saturate your hearing aids. And plus that would happen with 65 dB because average speech is 65 dB SPL. When you're doing reference test gain, however, the, the volume is only 60. So look what it says here. LTAS, what the Sam Hill is that? Long-term average speech spectrum. It says it right here in this line, if I can hear it. There you go, the grayed out line there. At one meter distance, long-term average speech spectrum is about 65 dB SPL. The peaks in speech in that spectrum are about 12 dB above this long-term average. And so you reduce your volume by 12 dB so that speech peaks with 65 dB SPL inputs wouldn't saturate the hearing aid. Why 17 then? It simplifies measurement with generally used equipment because your input is 60 with reference test gain, not 65. So 65 plus 12 is the same as 60 plus 17. Those are the reasons for 17. Anyway, that's nerd territory. I'll never ask for that on an exam or a quiz. That's just for those who figure like it, they just want to know why, okay? Anyway, the hearing aid shows a frequency response in terms of output again, and numbers for high frequency average reference test gain with the volume control at a reference test gain position. So let's look at what that looks like. Here it is, it's the lighter line. Reference test gain. Here's the response, RESP, response for 60 inputs. There's your dotted line giving you the legend here. That's this. But notice how it's plotted. Look at the vertical axis here. It's all output. So how is this reading in gain? 
you're going to have to take the value at one. And let's look at the peak here. It's 110. What was my input? 60. So what's my gain here? 110 minus 60. It's 50. Okay, when you're looking at it, what's the average then? You're going, what's the output at 1,000 hertz? About 110. What's the output at about 1,600? About 105, no, 102, something like that. What's the output at 1,600? Oh, about 110 again. You'd have to add up, or the, the machine adds up those three numbers, divides by three, and what do you got? 48. Okay? So, very important point to note here. Only this, this, they're both of these frequency responses are displayed, shown to you in terms of dBSPL output. But your question with this lighter curve is, what was the reference test gain? And to figure out that, you'd have to look at the value at whatever that lighter curve was and look at that value in dBSPL output and then minus or subtract the input, which is 60. Okay? And because of that, you can end up with a true number representing what was your gain. What was your average, regular, good old gain with the volume reduced to, to, to more approximate a user level and with the input of only 60? Well, about 48 in this case. All right? Now, reference test gain is not shown on hearing aid specs. There's, no, there's nothing that you can match. It's not like you've got a correct one or an incorrect one. There is no, what do you call it, tolerance level to determine whether it's correct or not. It's just meant for you as a clinician to get an idea of how the hearing aid should be functioning in terms of its frequency response and its gain. So we've now covered three things. OSPL90, that's pedal to the metal with 90 coming in, okay? Full on gain, pedal to the metal, but less input. And now you're looking at gain and not output. Third one, reference test gain. Volume is, 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 the input is still held at 60, just like it was with full on gain, but now you're reducing the volume as well. Why? To get a better idea of what the hearing aid's doing in real, everyday life. And to repeat the point a third time, although the curve is shown in units of dBSPL, which is output, to find the gain, you'd have to subtract from the output what was the input, and that will give you the gain. Always remember, input plus gain is output. Output minus input is gain. All right, and it's just one plus two is three, three minus two is one. It's very slain and pimple, but I'll tell you that little formula or that little one plus two is three, input plus gain is output, bites more people in the rear end than you can believe. It's just that for some reason people forget that and then they get lost incredibly. Look at now we wind down here. What is equivalent input noise? Oh, well, by the way, what's grayed out here? Tolerance, not applicable. Okay, remember, not applicable. It's just meant for you, the clinician, to have an idea. Now look at equivalent input noise. The purpose is to determine the internal crap generated by the hearing aid. What is it's crap? If it's not Scottish, it's crap. All right? Always remember that. That sounds more Russian than Scottish. Anyway, <laughs> it concerns the mic and the amplifier. Okay? It's the hardware. Remember, ANSI is all about the hardware. What's the junk being produced by the hearing aid? Procedure, volume control is left at reference test gain position. Just leave it. Now you're in test number four. And by the way, BTW, by the way, you're not sitting here manually doing all of this stuff. The only thing you are doing is putting the hearing aid onto the 2cc coupler, closing the lid of the box, pushing the button to do ANSI testing, and automatically OSPL90 and full-on gain are done for you. 
And then the machine that you'll see on the monitor, open lid, reduce volume to reference test gain position. And you reduce it by 17 dB, and then it'll say, close the lid, idiot. Now the test will continue. Okay, push the button and continue the test. And it will automatically then do your reference test gain. It'll then follow by automatically doing your equivalent input noise. And it'll follow by automatically doing your harmonic distortion. Done. Hit finish, print in the guy's file. Done. Okay? But look at now equivalent input noise. Volume control left at reference test gain position. Input is 60, just like uh, with our re reference test gain. Here now they're measuring the output. Get this. They're measuring the output with a 60 dB input. Then they're switching off the sound source and they're measuring the output again with no input. EIN, equivalent input noise, get this, is the output with no input minus the reference test gain. Amazingly, there's actually something left over. Do you believe that? I, uh, that's what I can't, uh, that, that to me is the wildest part of this whole thing. You're measuring the output with diddly squat coming into the mic and you're taking that output and you're subtracting number three reference test gain from that and you're actually going to have something left over good grunt that tells you how much noise is produced by a hearing aid okay what's the tolerance 30 db your equivalent input noise should be less than 30 dB, and it usually is. It's usually in the high teens, low 20s, okay? That means there's no, your hearing aid is functioning. Okay, Jack. The last one, harmonic distortion. The purpose here is to find out is the output faithful to the input? Is the, is the input being preserved and nothing being added to it by the hearing aid? To, to determine the distortion that occurs from hearing aid, is the output proportionate to the input? Harmonic distortion. Okay, be quiet, Michelle Jackson. Don't want to hear from you. Okay, procedure. And notice here, harmonic distortion products are frequencies in the output which are multiples of the fundamental frequency. Multiples. Now, what are those? If your fundamental frequency, that's the lowest frequency, if that's 100 hertz, what's the next harmonic? 200 hertz. What's the next harmonic? 300 hertz. Next harmonic? Four. So, harmonics are multiple multiples of the fundafrigmental frequency, okay? What are octaves? Octaves are a doubling of frequency. So your audiogram, 125 hertz, the next one, 250, that's also a harmonic of 125 because it's an equal multiple of the fundamental. 500 hertz, however, is double 250, and 1,000 is double 500 and then 2,000, 4,008. So audiograms are divided in, multi, in, in octaves. Harmonics are equal multiples of the fundamental. A little bit different. Anyway, for low frequencies, these distortion products can be seen and can indicate distortion of the hearing aid. And notice we say low frequencies. How come? Why not highs? Well, if you're testing at 8,000 hertz, what's the next harmonic? 16,000 hertz. That's out of the range of, the, of all the equipment. 4,000 hertz, what's the next harmonic? Eight. Well, that's out of the range. By the, by the time you're out at 8,000 hertz, your hearing aid frequency response is dropping off like a stone as well. So that's why they use low frequency inputs so that their multiples, their harmonics can still be read well within the range of the hearing aid. And what are those three frequencies? 500, 800, and 1600 hertz. I didn't make this stuff up. This is ANSI. Hey man, don't blame me. I'm just the piano player, okay? Anyway, procedure. Volume control at reference test gain position, leave it alone, just like you did with equivalent input noise. 
inputs of pure tones, 5, 8, 1600. These are increased to 70. Do distortion harmonics occur? Lows are used because harmonics are equal multiples of these fundamental frequencies. If highs were used as inputs, their harmonics would occur outside the frequency response of the ding-dong receiver. Tolerances should be less than 10% at all test frequencies. And often you will find, oh, there's a 2% distortion at 500 or a 2% distortion. These are just examples or a 1% distortion at 1600. That's cool. Okay. The distortion should be less than 10% at all test frequencies. And of course, within plus or minus 3 dB of manufacturer specs. All right. Now, where is that shown in the PowerPoint here? Well, here you go. Frequency, don't worry about F1 and F2. Those concern the breadth of the frequency response, not used by you, the clinician, very much. Those are mostly for the manufacturer, okay? So ignore the F1 and F2 crap. We don't really care. Frequency distortion. Look at it. 500, 3%, 800, 2%, 1,600, 1%. Each of those is less than 10. Good. The noise. What's the equivalent input noise? 20 dB, that's good. All right, fine, hearing aid passes. You're gonna see something here called attack time, release time, but we don't really care about that so much. It's mainly the five tests that I went over. OSPL 90, full on gain, reference test gain, equivalent input noise, harmonic distortion, slap yourself in the head with, a, and say, hey, done. All right, cool. So, now we look at more on distortion, just read with me. We talked about this, but just to underline this for the folks who are gonna be listening to a recording of this. More on amplitude distortion. Harmonic distortion, and I put harmonic in italics. You see that? Harmonic distortion occurs when a simple, pure tones become complex sounds. In English, when you put in 500 hertz, did 500 hertz come out of the hearing aid and did its little brother, 1,000 uh, hertz? And did its little sister, 1,500 hertz? Okay, and then the dog, 1,200 or 2,000 hertz? You know what I'm saying? Multiples of 500, okay? Now, that's harmonic distortion is when simple, pure tones become complex sounds. In other words, when pure tones are put into the mic. Okay, for example, 500 hertz ends up having harmonics at 1,000, 1,500, etc. These unwanted distortion products are created by the mic, by the amplifier, and you want to make sure that they are under 10%. Cool. Well, that's harmonic distortion, but the cochlea itself is an amplifier. Never forget this. This is why we have wide dynamic range compression hearing aids. WDRC is an electronic imitation of your outer hair cells. They it, these hearing aids amplify soft sounds by the most, and as the input becomes louder, the hearing aid automatically backs off. By the way, this should often be used as an explanation to consumers as to why hearing aids cost so much. They're an amplifier that automatically changes its volume, constantly, depending on the input. Try doing that with your uh, CD player. It doesn't do that, okay? So anyway, I digress. The cochlea itself is an amplifier. It too distorts, and its distortion is called autoacoustic emissions, OAEs. Recall, inner hair cells can pick up sounds that are from... 50 and above, but the outer hair cells amplify softer sounds than 50. The cochlea, it reads here, is not a perfect amplifier either. It produces distortion products as well. These are picked up by a sensitive probe mic inserted in your ear canal, just like tympanometry. Tympanometry puts a probe in your ear. OAEs uses a very similar probe. If you can get OAEs, Great, it shows the outer hair cells are functioning. OAEs, how loud are they? About 20 dB above the noise floor in your ear canal. 
the external auditory meatus. And notice your noise floor can be minus 10 dB. So never think that zero dB SPL is the absence of sound. Zero dB SPL is simply the softest it takes for a normal hearing human to hear a 1000 hertz tone at a one meter distance from a speaker. Okay, that's, a th that's zero dB SPL. The softest it takes to hear a 1000 hertz tone with two ears at one meter from a speaker. Can you have softer sounds than that? Yep, you betcha. You can have minus 20 dB SPL, minus 40 dB SPL. I don't know, you can. So always remember that. So the noise floor in your ear canal might be minus 10. OAEs might be about 20 dB above the noise floor. They might be present at about 10 dB SPL. They're soft, but they're there. Anyway, that's, they, they're produced from the outer hair cells. And otoacoustic emissions are produced at lower frequencies than the inputs. When they do OAEs, and I'm just going to stop sharing screen here and just blab at you now. OAEs, they take a probe, they put it in your ear canal, and two tones come out of that probe. One tone is, 11, is, 12, is 1,000 hertz. The other tone is 1,200 hertz. They're divided by, by 1.2, a ratio of 1 to 1.2. If 2,000 hertz is put in, the other one is 2,400 hertz. When these pairs of tones are put in the ear, a third one comes out. And the third one coming out is lower in frequency than the two tones that they put in. Okay? Doesn't matter. That's your distortion product, autoacoustic emission. At any rate, so unlike harmonic distortion, where the distortion is found in harmonics that are higher in frequency than the tone that was put into the hearing aid, with autoacoustic emissions, the, 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 the unwanted harmonic or whatever is below the two frequencies that are put in. Okay? Just an just a, just a anecdotal piece of, I don't know, interesting information. Again, I won't quiz you on it, but remember, harmonics are, put, are found when a pure tone is put in and the harmonics are above the pure tone frequency. They are un, uh, multiples of the fundamental. OAEs, two tones are put in and the harmonic that comes out, you're looking at a lower frequency. And that's because you're putting in more than just one tone, you're putting in two. So you've got intermodulation distortion. Nonetheless, both are distortions. Both are caused by amplifiers. We measure harmonic distortion in hearing aids. In people, we measure autoacoustic emissions because that too is a distortion of interest. So that finishes our ANSI coverage. Next week, we're going to talk more about fitting methods. And we're going to delve into what you covered in 150. And we're going to make sure that we all have a good grip on what you learned in Hearing Aid Fitting Methods, HIS 150, because you covered fitting methods there, but we're going to just review them, just like we did with ANSI testing. That way you've got ANSI down, you've got fitting methods down, pat, and now we can launch into real ear. Okay, so we'll spend two weeks on fitting methods, and that will be unit three. All right, unit three. The, we will request once again that you print up your notes ahead of time. Yeah. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Hey, are we good there? Are we good there, Amber? We got we got her all down. How's it, how's it going? Good stuff. All righty. Thanks for showing up. It's nice to have a guest. Okay. Thank well, you. You bet. We'll see you next week. Okay. All right. Have a great week. Yeah. Bye -bye. You too. All right. Ciao.